live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in a morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, November 19th, 2018. It's uh, Thanksgiving week, unless you're a Canadian, in which case, uh, I guess, uh, what, is it Christmas week? Do you guys do Canadian Christmas a little early, too? That would be a great idea. I don't see why you shouldn't get a jump on things. Well, actually, I guess you should back it up. Do it after, and then you could take advantage of sale pricing. That would be a lot smarter. All right, well, uh, you know. It's no point letting uh, economic science get in the way of a good opening. If anybody ever comes across a good opening, <laughs> let me know. Send it my way. I'll be able to use it. Good morning. It is uh, it is Thanksgiving week here in the United States, and we're all getting ready for that. We'll be, of course, taking Wednesday through Friday off the air from the live show, trying to scramble to put together some material for you to keep things going. There's plenty to read. It's just a matter of will I have time to read it and get it down on tape and edit it into usable form in time for you to enjoy it this weekend or well i'm assuming you'll enjoy it this week and uh not weekend but week and uh well that's a rather big assumption much to catch up with although it wasn't the craziest weekend i have seen in a long time but there were definitely developments uh they were dumb enough and splashy enough that you would have taken notice of them already. Of course, Donald Trump insisting that uh, the president of Finland absolutely positively did tell him that the reason that they don't have forest fires in that very northerly uh, Nordic, that's sort of redundant nation, uh, though they are a forest nation, that part he paid attention to, apparently. The president of Finland did admit to calling it that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he's got no idea. He, uh, that is to say, the Finnish president has no idea why our president would have told the world that the Finns had offered us the advice that we wouldn't have problems with wildfires if we would simply rake our forests. No one knows what the connection is between that and what's actually happening. Of course, they're not forest fires raging through California. They are wildfires. Yes, not the same thing. They ordinarily take place in a forest if they are forest fires. And also, no, there's no way that you can just rake up forests and prevent fires from breaking out. I mean, if you cared about what the reality of that situation was, the Finns uh, apparently uh, are big on forest management, and that's because a lot of the country is covered with forest and they make a good deal of their money exporting forest products. That's paper by the way, and uh, given the, the, what, the, what grows in the forests there. And there is a, they have a fine forest management system, I'm sure. The, the Finnish president, the fa okay, do we really care about the facts behind all this? He, he did spend some time, I guess, or admitted to spending some time with Trump and explaining to him how they have a very high-tech forest monitoring system, a, a system of monitoring the forests, in case of fire, so that if they, if a fire breaks out somewhere, they spot it quickly and can control it quickly. But none of it involves raking of any kind, and it was never mentioned. Uh, although if you really want to dig for something here to try and save the White House, if that's your interest, apparently there's a, a way to do it. The Finns spent the weekend mocking Trump which I suspect they were already doing even before he mentioned anything about their country. But this time we're paying attention, which is the, the real news here, that uh, I can't tell you historically when the last time the United States was the butt of a running joke in Finland that we became acutely aware of. I, I can't tell you for certain that we haven't always been the butt of running jokes in Finland, but this time we've become aware of it, which is the real problem. But they spent the weekend uh, tweeting pictures of themselves with rakes in the forest, mocking the president. In fact, the best one I saw was a woman who tweeted a picture of herself vacuuming in the forest. Just another typical day here in the, in the Finnish forest, she said. And uh, they have a hashtag for it. And it's in Finnish, and so there's not much chance that I'll be able to pronounce it quickly, uh, correctly. 
Uh, quickly, I can pronounce it. That's no problem. But uh, so I said there was a, a, we, a, a just a tiny kernel of truth in all this. There usually is something that, that Trump mangles horribly. Apparently, the hashtag they're using, it's the word that means raking in Finnish, but I guess due to the quirks of languages other than our own, which has no quirks whatsoever, the word also is used to refer to a, a sort of forest rescue, like searching for people who might have been lost in the forest. Uh, but if, if you believe that as an explanation for why Trump would make this error, then you have to think, oh, well, Trump is only a beginning student in the Finnish language and may have confused their word for raking with the word for forest rescue, which is sort of maybe reminiscent of the sort of forest management program they might be executing there in Finland. And so therefore, it's entirely understandable. Of course, he has no idea about that. Uh, someone once told him that uh, there was a, an old issue back in the day, and I think it lingers now, that if you uh, – that the lumber industry was very interested in salvaging what they called blow-down timber, trees that actually just fell on their own. And they were, in, they were insisting that that would help control wildfires and forest fires if they would be allowed to go into these protected areas and, and salvage blow-down timber. And I think that has sort of – more, that's a very 80s, 90s issue, and, and you know how Trump's head is stuck there. So it's his view that uh, if you just clean up and maybe mulch a little bit, everything will be fine. It also happens to help to have, you know, like 50 times the rainfall that Southern California has and uh, be, you know, partially above the Arctic Circle. Anyway, other than that, nothing else happened, I think. No, there were a few other crazy things. Greg Dworkin is here. He's cataloged them for us. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So really, what we should do is uh, finish up with this forest uh, fire, there could uh, be no wildfire end kind of stuff. Sure. You know, uh, Trump had a tweet, of course, in 2015, where he said, who's oh. paying for this tedious Smokey Bear commercial that's on all the time enough already? <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, like a 50-year-old. always has a tweet for everything, but he had that one. That is amazing. 50-year-old run, this thing is. Yeah. And then this one. Uh, this is... From The <laughs> Guardian, but I've seen this in it's a couple of different places Yeah, where Trump goes to California, says stupid things, and people have kind of had enough. They're kind of busy. Uh -huh. yes. uh, these folks had to evacuate in Northern California. There uh, are hundreds of evacuees at a Walmart in Chico, yes. frantically trying to figure out the next steps. And then uh, Walmart's trying to evict them, too. Right. President flows, uh, flies by helicopter there to meet first really? responders and victims. That was possible. And he says there's no reason for these massive, deadly and costly forest fires in California, except that forest management is so poor. Billions of dollars are given each year with so many lives lost, all because of gross mismanagement of the forest. No. Of course, this happened in a private it, uh, that particular fire started in a private area. And then, oh, wow. you know, part of the problem with places like Paradise is like there's only one road. It's in a canyon, so uh, hmm. you, you really had trouble getting out. Um, when asked about the president's visit to the area, Kirk Ellsworth, whose adult children lost their homes in the fire, shook his head in disgust. My kids lost everything. I voted for him, and now he can kiss my red ass. What well, he said is ridiculous. It hurts my heart. A lot of us voted for him, and he talks down to us. <laughs> and that's basically a theme no you know, uh, we'll get back to maybe a little bit later in the show about how the election went. Right. But Trump talks down and insults so many different people, be it the military, farmers in the Midwest. Uh, you know, this particular uh, person is talking about uh, Trump voters in Northern California. And that's how you lose people. And you don't yeah, get them right. back after that. So it's a little I, by little drip and drab kind of thing. I never thought he would eat my face. Yeah. But, you know, I always thought it was that next guy over there. Right. So, uh, you know, there, there's all of that. But uh, I also wanted to highlight kind of a uh, community thing here uh, hmm. among the many people who have been hurt. And, and there's still a thousand people missing. I mean, it's it's a tragedy. It's, it's like uh, the, the Puerto Rico disaster with the hurricane. Uh, media moves on and kind of almost stops talking about it, at least on the East Coast. And you wonder about East Coast prejudice there. But there's a thousand people still missing. It's, it's a disaster yes. uh, in terms of what's going on there. And this piece is a fundraiser hmm. that was posted, uh, burned out by California fire with parrots. My friend Sally lived <laughs> near Paradise, California with the three parrots. 
Those are the cages above on the right, sticking out of the ashes of her home. And it's a, a story about how she barely got out and lost everything. Mm. And it's a fundraiser on GoFundMe. Okay. That's, That's how cool. we take care of things these days. That is yes. how we take care of things these days. But I'm adding this community note at the end. Yeah, it says, no I'm editing this story this. to assuage the concerns of GoFundMe. That there oh. must be something shady going on here because we've raised so much money so quickly without apparent reference to Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> okay, that's that's the validator for them. I see. And then they give she gives her name and says, "I'm proud to be a registered user of Daily Coast. I know my friend Sally, the subject of this campaign, even though I live in New Jersey and she lives in California, because we're both part of the extraordinary online community there. The reason this campaign has been so very active is that when we post on Daily Coast." That a member of our community is in trouble, people turn out, and uh, the comments show that. And I predict more love for tomorrow. GoFundMe's other questions are, I think, already answered above. Note that the campaign is an action taken collectively by individuals and is in no way the action of Daily Coast or Coast Media LLC. So what happened is Daily Coast community came together and raised yeah. a ton of money really quickly, which is what we do. Mm. And GoFundMe got the idea that oh, they must be Russians or something. What's, yeah. Or maybe this is money laundering. How can you it's possibly raise so much money so fast and you didn't even use Facebook, in which case we would have ignored it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, which is uh, – it, that is pretty hilarious considering, well, where is the nefarious Russian activity actually taking place? Daily exactly posts right. or Facebook? Oh, it's happening on Facebook. Oh, okay. Well, if you're raising your money on Facebook, then it's fine. It's it. You know, they're ignorant of Daily Coast, and I can sort of understand that. But yeah, it, it is kind of funny that. But your think, listening community will totally understand it. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was pretty that is cool. an excellent point. And GoFundMe is dumb. Yeah. Well. I mean, uh, it, they're being help, dumb. You know, it'll help people. They're being dumb, but hopefully they'll help people. Yeah. And, uh, well, we have to do these things from time to time. I'm glad it's not a, a you know, a, another one of those healthcare stories, which is, a, you know, th this is like, okay, you know, there's not, uh, there's fire insurance, but that's, you won't see that for months. This is immediate help. That's a great. All right. Well, congratulations to uh, those who organized that and, uh, for bringing up that excellent point about, yeah, you know, there are other things other than Facebook. Right. So let's, uh, Finish up on elections because that's some of the things that happened over the weekend. And, right. of course, the Daily Coast election staff uh, has terrific roundups on this. This one is their morning, oh. morning digest from today. California GOP Congresswoman Luces Ray, she said months ago, wasn't even competitive. And that's, She's of smart. course, uh, Mimi Walters, who lost to Katie Porter. And uh, tells the story about how she never saw it coming. And when she saw it coming, she denied it was coming. Well, and actually told the people in Washington, don't worry about me. You don't even need to raise money for me. I got this. It's Orange Valley, California. What, yeah. what possibly could go wrong? These polls are a Chinese hoax. Yeah. Actually, what happened is in Orange County, California, all six of those districts went yep. blue. Home of Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. Yeah. Um, so uh, she didn't see it coming. And uh, the only people that did are Paul Ryan's uh, Congressional Leadership Fund, which put about a million and a half bucks uh, her way, mm -hmm. which turned out to be useless. Yes. Uh, so she wound up losing. And that is actually a wonderful thing. That was California 45. Yes. But other races that were called over the weekend California include uh, California 39. That's Gil Cisneros, who wound up... Uh, uh, beating young Kim. Yes. Uh, who was the, I believe, staffer for Ed Royce, the retiring Republican there. Yeah, I can't get over that. I say it's a weird name, not like, oh my gosh, it's so foreign. I just, young Kim makes it sound it's like, like little Richard. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'm sorry that happened to you, young Kim, but you've got a long career ahead of you. Exactly. Maybe. Um, so, sorry. uh, other races, big races, of course, that were uh, settled is the Florida Senate and governor races uh -huh. in favor of the Republicans. It turned out the recount got Nelson a couple of thousand votes, which is more than people thought it would. But the design of the ballot was such that, uh, it probably cost him undervotes because it, yeah. uh, violated the basic principle of Florida ballots, which is that you don't put a race well below all the instructions for how you vote because people's eyes glaze over and they don't look yes. down that far. Leave that column to itself. 
you know, use that uh, this space intentionally left blank template. You, if you run, you know, if you don't use the whole column for instructions, just move over. Right. Yeah. Oh. In Georgia, the race is over. But Stacey Abrams didn't exactly concede. She said Kemp won, but we really need to stand for voting rights because a million people were scrubbed from the ballot, and that's terrible. And, uh, you know, he was about 17,500 votes above the threshold that you need for a runoff. Hmm. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, uh, what happened in California, not California, but uh, but what happened all over the country is actually rather remarkable. And Dave Wasserman has been tracking this and Nate Silver commented on it uh, to the point that the Democrats overall, when you look at the House vote, by the time California is counted, probably mm -hmm. got something like. 60 million votes. Yes, that's a lot of millions. In a midterm, which is an enormous number. Consider that uh, Donald Trump in the presidential election got about that. I think he got 61 million. Yeah. But Democrats voted like that. in presidential levels during this midterm, which is just an astounding thing. And Silver goes on to point out that the last Republican wave, they got something like 45 million votes. I mean, so the idea that this was or wasn't a wave, this is an enormous number of votes yes. in many places. Uh, maybe, you know, like Ohio or Wisconsin, especially if you look at state level, gerrymanders make it such that that's not enough to overwhelm Republican incumbents because it mm. was constructed not to. But those gerrymander barriers, those walls, the wall that, that Trump wanted built, yes. was actually <laughs> internal, not external. Uh, nonetheless, it was overwhelmed by the number of Democratic uh, voters. And so in the end, when you start adding up exactly where we are at, it turns out that uh, we will gain probably, we already have gained 37 seats in the house i predicted 40 and we'll probably get 38 because new york 22 is still to be determined hmm, okay. uh, we may get as much as 39 if utah four switches but right now mia love who got no love is still probably going to eke that out and georgia seven is potentially uh under recount uh yes, with sorry. a very slim 400 some odd uh, point lead vote lead for the republican so we're probably going to get 38. okay I could take a pretty it. good number, uh, given all the gerrymandering and everything else. So basically, uh, winning the national vote by eight points gets you 38 seats. And right now, I think we're leading by 7.7%, uh, which pretty much matches the generic ballot. So for those people who say, well, what does a generic ballot tell us? Actually, it tells us everything. It, mm. it told us what was going to happen, and in fact, it happened. Okay, well... Yeah, it's always, you know, and polling you're using might it work. For predictive purposes. In okay. the Senate, uh, we'll get 47 seats, and uh, probably the Republicans will get uh, 53 seats, and that'll be a, a gain of uh, two for them. But we have to wait for next week to really see, because you know why? Mississippi why? has a runoff. What? Yeah. And the funniest thing is, SB's competitive. That's... The Democrats. That would be something, wouldn't it? Uh, is it like a uh, Alabama situation where the Republican put up somebody who's so racist and so incompetent that, in fact, the Democrat has a chance? Why, yes, it is. Oh. Does that mean that they'll win? Unclear. Okay. Uh, but they might. Yeah. I mean, it, it's – it's uh, the odds are against. That's the odds are against. You know, in Alabama, the Democrat who was a good guy – uh, was running against a child molester and a pedophilia, uh, uh, you know, sponsor. Sufferer. <laughs> and, yes. And that is, you know, that kind of cuts across party lines. In Mississippi, the Democrat's yes. a good guy, but is running against a racist. That's more traditional in terms yeah. of party lines. True. That so I think it's a little tougher uh, uh, a battle. On the other hand, uh, the number of uh, black voters 
well, the, the African American uh, population in Mississippi, I think last time I looked at something, if I got this and I remember correctly, something like 37 percent, a little higher than in other states. And again, if I recall correctly, I don't have this right in front of me. Uh, black women in Mississippi, I think, vote at a higher rate than like anybody else in the country. <laughs> Is that because they're voting twice? No, oh. uh, it's, it's put on mustaches, right? Uh, <laughs> that could be it. Yeah. Nobody who they are. Uh, so it's very the, difficult the, to vote. There, it I is. Understand. So the, the turnout mm -hmm. uh, should be good, mm -hmm. but how many are registered and how many will actually vote remains to be seen. But this is a race that Democrats could win. I would love that. Even though Republicans are the favorites. That would be fantastic. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't change the, the majority, but look, anything that closes the gap, any Democrat that can defeat an, a Republican who will only vote in lockstep with Trump, good thing. It would be plus great. one. If if that happened, that would be a plus one rather than, uh, you know, a plus two for the Republican yes. right. in a year where the map said that they should be plus ten. Yes, that would be the and most amazing. The thing. only thing that they won really uh, the election where the Democrats did remarkably well, as we were just talking about in the House. And, uh, you know, part of the theme of what's going on here is Trump having to deal with the fact that despite all of his bluster, he knows he lost. I mean, it even made the hill. That, that he lost? The hill is usually just like a Republican rag that just mm -hmm. repeats Republican talking points. Yeah. Right? But uh, the memo from Niall okay, Stanich. The memo. Trump seethes two weeks after the midterms. Ah, okay. I saw He's that. He's seething publicly and privately almost two weeks after the elections, which he had first believed he had scored a moral victory. Democrats had run up the score in the House, and the political world turned his focus to ominous signs for the president's reelection hopes, which was the theme of my pundit roundup this morning. Ah. In response, Trump has hit out on Twitter in impromptu comments to reporters. And behind the scenes is no better. The issue was an election night, but 10 days later, we're still seeing the fallout and losing races, said one source familiar with the president's thinking. Other sources mm. who spoke with The Hill described a similar atmosphere. So this is more than just John Barron. Right after the election, we felt a sense of release, relief that the blue wave had been so great. But there's been a rising tide of Democrats flipping Republican seats over the past week and a half. And that really has concerned Republicans and raised eyebrows. And that gets back to the whole idea that on election night at 8 p.m., yeah. when it looked like we weren't winning in Florida, there was like doom and gloom everywhere. James Carville came on TV and said, yeah. it doesn't look like a wave to me. And in fact, that's not really what happened. He was wrong. It was a wave. And uh, the post-election uh, status has been that Democrats just keep winning. Yeah. That's uh, how they wound up taking Orange County, California. Pretty good. Uh, so Trump is at, at first okay, and then... It sinks in that he's lost, and now he needs somebody to blame. So we had a post-election uh, press conference where he basically listed, you know, the Mike Kaufmans and the Carlos Carbello, and even incorrectly uh, Mia Love, and said it's mm -hmm. their fault because they didn't embrace me. Yes, yeah, right. He has right. not yet reversed on that. I mean, it doesn't matter. He, when it when necessary, he just will say, "I was always with her." Right. So. So uh, what's the analysis when people actually start to look at this? Well, uh, Jennifer Rubin, the GOP has just two problems, Trump and Trumpism. <laughs> hey, Stan they're related. Greenberg in the New York Times, Trump is beginning to lose his grip. It isn't just white suburban women who switched okay. to Democrats. Parts of rural and white working class America peeled off, too. Oh, hmm. I didn't hear about that in the diner. The Economist, among the many ways Donald Trump has transferred American politics is by rearranging the country's electoral map in 2016. He broke through the blue wall. Uh, he also set record lows for Republican presidential candidates' performance in areas with higher levels of schooling, such as Orange County, California. A little foreshadowing there, right? Yeah. In the 2018 midterms, Mr. Trump's party appears to have been stuck with all the electrical co electrical, uh, electoral Maybe. costs of this strategy and none of the gains. Whites with college degrees still flocked to the Democrats. Orange County, previously home to four House Republicans, is expected to send none to the next Congress. And many of the regions that defected from the Democrats to support Mr. Trump in 2016 returned to their liberal roots this year, including in the Midwest. Now, it may be that Ohio is looking more like Kentucky, and it may be that Iowa is looking more like Kansas. 
in the sense that they're naturally Republican and Democrats win only when the Republicans really screw up. But Republicans are totally capable of screwing up. And this is, of course, without a recession. And this is without, uh, you know, the Mueller report, which Mm. uh, everybody in Washington is expecting to come with indictments soon. They were waiting for Trump to do his homework and return his written statements, following which everybody's expecting some major indictments to come down the line. Yes. Well, so that'll take us to the break, but that's yeah. the, the state of the art. That's what happened this weekend. I, I think that's well. That's a pretty good recap of it. Uh, a couple of things that uh, the last bit reminded me of was just uh, again how uh, we've spent the last two years, I guess, you know, listening to you reporting on the polls and telling us, look, you know, the the support is falling away. Uh, it's not the case that. LOL, chipping YOLO, away. nothing matters, right? right. It, it's and, not going over a cliff, but it's chipping away a little here, a little yeah, there. Yeah, a little bit like the wave developed. And uh, yeah, it's it's been very interesting because, of course, uh, the newspapers who and, and various other media who still kind of refuse to acknowledge that they blew the 2016 election by focusing on emails when they should have had their eyes elsewhere, spent the subsequent two years interviewing people in diners who swore they still supported Trump, even as the polls said... You should be looking elsewhere because fewer and fewer people are supporting Trump. And uh, you'll you'll notice that when we actually finally do have the election, uh, there may be a blue wave. And then, of course, uh, the evening itself arrived and they brought on experts who were uh, only too happy to jump on things at eight o'clock and say, nope, no wave. So uh, in many ways, 2018 was blown just as badly. It just didn't matter because the voters took care of business instead of relying on the newspapers to do it for them. Well, listen to us. We were right about Iraq. Yeah, that's right. And probably some other stuff, too. And if not, I'll change my tune after this break. I don't know. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Welcome back. Uh, let's see. I wanted to just add this one point. I was just talking to Greg during the break. Uh, one thing that I was reminded of, it's not a huge revelation or anything, uh, but the, the parrot story that you had brought up before, it, it reminded me a great deal, the concerns of GoFundMe and the fact that they had never, I guess, understood that. I don't know whether they had ever heard of Daily Coast or not. That's really not it it's it's more that they basically think that only facebook and possibly twitter are capable of raising that kind of money and uh well of course i mean if you knew daily coast and you took a look at the fundraising record of daily coast that uh, i mean we really killed it this year but year after year we've raised amazing amounts of money for political campaigns they're just not paying attention to that but uh, it kind of struck me like their panic about it sort of struck me a little bit like the stories we heard towards the end of the election from various Republicans around the country uh, when they heard that their opponents had raised incredible amounts of money through Act Blue. And they began to like panic and they were telling their constituents essentially that Act Blue was some sort of weird, nefarious, possibly George Soros funded underground network of illegal contra- contributions largely coming probably from illegal aliens, etc. But they, they were astonished when they would see FEC reports that said that their opponents had raised millions through Act Blue, and they have literally no idea what Act Blue is. They just thought it's some dark money group, and they didn't realize, no, it's just a website that says, hey, if you're interested in donating to Democrats, we're sort of a clearinghouse for that. 
maybe you want to demo, uh, donate to a race that you don't know where to send the money, we'll take care of that for you. Just click here. That candidate gets that money. Very easy to use. They've raised millions, billions, in fact. And, uh, yeah, uh, totally clueless on the other side as to how that could possibly be happening and assuming that any time a Democrat raises money, it must be illegal. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Doesn't it doesn't help any parrots, but yeah, well, it you know, it's just it's it's an interesting, interesting story. You know, people it's like very, parrots. That's a terrific one. I really uh, love people that also one. like so you know, the, 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 the actual uh, humans who live in those houses, but they also like parrots. Yeah. Well, you ask the parrots what they think. Exactly. They'll well, tell, they'll you, tell you, the, you. That's the thing. Yeah. Right. And they'll tell you what the people told them to tell you, too. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, enough of that. And then they'll be hired by AP and they'll be great. White House <laughs> that's true. Raking there is, works. Uh, Nate Silver writes, there's not uh -huh. any precedent for an opposition party coming this close to matching the president's vote total from two years earlier, where it looks like the Democrats will get 96 percent of what Trump got. OK, that is pretty remarkable. The yes. closest to an exception was when the Democrats in 1970 got 92 percent of Nixon vote total from 68 in that hotly disputed Nixon Humphrey election. Mm. Well, People have okay. made Nixon comparisons. Right. Normally, you're getting about 60 to 70 percent of the vote. The Democrats got 96 percent of the vote. That was actually good. And uh, uh, looks like uh, Trump's total uh, was actually 63 million with uh, Clinton, you know, even topping that. But that's yeah. just an amazing election performance. And those of you who work so hard to get the vote out only to hear James Carville tell you it was in a way you should feel very good about what you did. Yeah, and we should put you on television, mm -hmm. all 63 million of you. Right. Now, there are, of course, are plenty of clouds to this uh, silver lining. For example, uh, Trump is still president. That is bad. And the fact that people vote for him regardless, uh, some of it is just blind uh, party loyalty, but some of it is nativism. Yes. And uh, sure. this is an interesting uh, piece uh, by Nick Davis and John Green. Immigration attitudes continue to protect voter choice. Nativism isn't going away. Uh, and the fact that Trump continues to try and stoke this, he thinks, helped him in certain Senate races in limited areas, which may or may not have been true. It may have had nothing to do with it. It didn't help him in Arizona. It didn't help him in uh, Montana. It didn't help him in Nevada. Hmm. And it's there's a lot of natives help them in the House. So, you know, it's a, it's an argument that, look, those folks are going to vote red anyway. And, and Trump's nativism had nothing to do with it. Nonetheless, there are people uh, who vote for Trump and the Republicans enthusiastically hmm. ah. because of that. So right. what is nativism and why does it matter? As a suite of attitudes involving immigration, legal or otherwise, nativism is something of an amorphous psychometric construct. It can oh. conceivably involve rational beliefs rooted in economic self-interest. That's where the argument about is it economic self-interest or is it racism? Uh, the answer oh, was okay. yes. Anxiety, yes. All right. If an influx of immigrants are perceived as a labor market threat, then native workers might react negatively toward the prospect of being displaced. Alternatively, nativism can involve negative reactions against immigrants who might displace cultural or social norms. And Trump was going for the cultural and social norms without question. So in this version, anti-immigrant sentiment more closely resembles raw prejudice. In either version, mm -hmm. the key ingredient with respect to negative attitudes toward non-natives involves perceptions of threat. Put simply, if immigrants might threaten material well-being or social status, then native persons may hold negative attitudes toward them. The problem regards the manner in which these sorts of attitudes are expressed, and more importantly, the ends to which they lead. Coherent immigration policy that takes seriously the idea that 10 million undocumented workers can't live in limbo and per in perpetuity and values notions of law and order is one thing insinuating immigrants are rapists thugs invaders is another uh insects who bring disease uh you know our quotes from trump and it's precisely the sort of dehumanizing rhetoric that usually pays away from mass atrocity the issue is not just academic it has real consequences so one can yes. recognize that folks are frightened about their current status be it economic or social without in any way, shape, or form buying into the idea that uh, that immigrants are somehow uh, less than human. And that's really the, the, the fight in terms of uh, 
trying to own the language. Yes. Well, the uh, the language is a little troubling. I wonder whether there there's probably would be some uh, some pushback even on the use of the term nativism for it. Nativism, I'm, I'm sure, natives for, object is a rejection of voluntary acceptance and incorporation of non-native non-citizens into the citizenry, and that that really is the gist of all of this. What are you going to do with the fucks? Yeah. Outgroup boundaries are notoriously Wait. firm and threat, whether material or existential, should be sufficient to reject outsiders. But there appears to be an asymmetry with respect to how Republicans and Democrats link these ideas, whether this is a unique feature of the present sociopolitical landscape or a broader fissure with political ideologies globally is a pressing question. That is to say, are Republicans authoritarian racists uh, or are they authoritarian racists? Discuss as the perpetual presidential campaign lurches forward to 2020. It is unlikely that the importance of the nativism will fade, particularly given the singular elite queue to which Republicans look for guidance, Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, who himself is a blustering nativist. So as long as Trump continues to talk like this, and he does, and as long as he continues to believe stuff like this, and he does, it's not going away. So, you know, this is a constant battle. It's not like, okay, we won the election and that puts that to rest. His... uh, Immigration caravan nonsense didn't work. His moving the military to the border was a stunt. Everybody sees that. We're done with that. No, no, no. Unfortunately not. You know, it'll come back in some other form because he really has nothing else. And, uh, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So just, you know, yes. that's the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and it's, 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 it's what we call a it's worm. A big, you know, thick W-Y-R-M. You can't kill it. All you can do is chop it to pieces. Okay. What do you call it? A W... <laughs> A worm, you know. A, a W Y R M. Okay. Old, old, old uh, Norse. You know, the, oh, the whole idea there. But those guys are okay. Is, is that you know it's immortal. You can't just you know do away with it. Mm-hmm. What you can do is you can suppress it. Yes. But it's going to come back. Uh, sure. It's like laundry. You know, no matter how often you do it, it just like shows up again. Well, that's my fault. I keep wearing it. And well, yeah, but I mean, there's various and sundry reasons for that. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. I, I would believe it. Uh, you can't just do it once and say, okay, laundry's done. I don't have yeah. to do it ever again. That's not how it works. It keeps uh, coming back. You have to keep doing it. My kids think so. And that's so. what's going to happen with nativism. You got to, you know, you got to get used to the way things are going to be with this new generation. They're pretty sure they have done laundry. It's finished. And they're I, right. You know, they I keep gotta, I got to do an explainer for Vox, right? I guess so. Yes. Why nativism is more like laundry and less like winning the last election. <laughs> That sounds more slaty than boxy. Yeah, but okay. Uh, Slate Yes. Now, by the way, uh, yes, I guess another of my objections to the the use of the term for this being nativism, and I, we could find a new term, but for instance, uh, the the notion that uh, Norwegian immigrants would somehow be okay. I mean, they're not native, so what's the story here? And of course, the story is racism. And I guess the guy didn't want to take on racism directly in his phd paper here but well you know there's there's plenty of papers that say it was so yeah. we have that so, we'll so what's those. happening in the real world well, this is from 11 14 2018 so it's a few days old but it's Ancient from Politico, history. and it says poll trump has little support for re-election bid well, as speculation then. for 2020 begins to heat up little more than three in ten americans want to see president donald trump win a second term in the white house according to a new poll this is from monmouth Though the president's approval rating stands steady at 43, only 37% of registered voters want to see him reelected compared to 58 who want someone new. So that's where we stand. I only mention that because, uh, again, the polling was right about the 2018 election. And uh, forget about your PTSD from 2016 and polling. The polling was right about the popular vote there, too. Hmm. Uh, the fact is that most people, and I think 58% can be fairly described as most people, most people don't want to see Donald Trump reelected. That doesn't mean he won't win reelection. It doesn't mean he will. It means that all the hot takes about, well, he's the favorite for 2020. Oh, I can't see anything on the horizon preventing him from being reelected. Well, of course he's going to be reelected. He's an incumbent. Incumbents always get reelected. All the other nonsense hot takes that you're going to see, they are not based on fact. Okay. I mean, they're based on old facts, a normal president. They're based they're not on based opinion. on this this thing. Uh, well, I mean, I guess you can. You I can, was wrong about 2016, so I'm never going to say Trump is going to lose, even though he just lost oh, well, the last election. That, that and even though people approach. say they don't want him back, 
I was burned in 2016, so I'm going to be very careful about admitting that, like, he's not very popular. Well, and that was another Nate Silver tweet that went around. Hmm. You know, Trump is incredibly in, historically unpopular. People yes. are afraid to say that. And if you admit it and you say it out loud and then you do your analysis based on that, you'll actually come up with better conclusions than if you keep saying, well, this mythical black swan thing is going to happen like several times in a row. Hmm. They're not wrong in saying that, uh, well, incumbent presidents typically win re-election. That is true. Yeah. It's Except just they don't, like George not, H.W. Bush. Uh, well, yeah, there was that one guy. Oh, and uh, uh, Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter. I mean, it happens. You know, but when you're incredibly unpopular, it's more likely to that's happen. That's when it's, yeah, okay. And that's that's the big difference here. This is a different, and even if you don't believe this is a different kind of president, I guess there you would have to say, well, which presidents lose? The ones who are incredibly right. unpopular. Oh. And then, the, then hmm. there's the hot takes about, oh, well, impeachment, trying to impeach the president's really good for us. Just look at what happened mm -hmm. to Bill Clinton. Yes. Uh, also a kind of a different person. situation here. Yeah. Okay. One one was personal life. The other one was like you sold out the country to the Russians, screwed us politically, are ignoring us in terms of uh, actual uh, states burning down, yes. and then you screwed up the military. Right. And you took a. Well, that's the same thing. It was what Clinton journalist. did, right? Yes. There was no. no, no, is what I meant to say. There. That's what you meant to say. So, right. Again, you know, it uh, will just it'll be interesting. But but Nate's no, right. But also, he is yes. really unpopular. And uh, as you start to peel off those voters who say, you know, I've just had enough of this, you know, he can kiss my red ass. Um, That's one. It makes it harder to reelect him. Uh, yes. Well, good. I hope he has more trouble. Is that fair? We're That's okay with that? Fair. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's very fair. Very good. Well, All right. I feel like Other we've been more well Politico were more state, uh, and uh, this is Nevada Independent. They're more state-oriented. Anatomy of a blue wave. Why Nevada Democrats won decisively in races they were supposed to be close. Uh, Politico, RIP California GOP. Republicans lash out after midterm election debacle. Uh, Ron Brownstein points out the smaller it gets, the more monolithic it gets, the whiter it gets, the more populist nationalist it gets. When you're seeing mm. in the Republican Party is that it's the party of white identity politics, which is another interesting point. This is from that Politico article, RIP California GOP. Uh, Republicans love to point at the Democrats and say identity politics, but actually the party that practices identity politics are Republicans and conservatives. Oh, yes. Because no it's populist, nationalist, white identity politics. Yeah. I, I don't just know why they think – I, oh, well, well done. I don't think uh, – Yeah, I, I don't, they love to – like everything else, it, uh, it's, we have this projection problem. You're the snowflakes and the identity politics people. Right. And if you don't agree, wah, cry, boycott. Okay, and then uh, two more. This one from the monkey cage from Washington Post. Is Trump mm -hmm. country really better off under Trump? No, actually, it's falling further behind. So yeah. he's not doing what he promised. And speaking of what he promised, this last piece from Daniel Dale, of course, the excellent uh, Toronto reporter who catalogs Trump lies on a daily basis, actually had a guest post in the Washington Post. Yeah. It's easy to fact check Trump's lies. He tells the same ones all the time. Yeah, that that does uh, it takes some of the magic out of what Daniel does, but uh, he's never claimed it was magic. He just said, "I'm doing it," and right. he's right. And again, going back to that uh, uh, California Republican voter who voted that for guy. Trump and now says, "You can kiss my red ass." I just like saying that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, if you keep telling lies and people catch on, it's like, my goodness, it's almost like Trump University. They hmm. get mad at you. Yeah. That's true. Well, maybe all we need is time here. Just we don't yeah, have it a takes lot. it. You know, people do not like being conned, but once you're conned, it takes a long, 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 long time for you to admit to it. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure that there's a psychological term for that. I don't know what it is, but it's a fact. Time. And so, uh, you know, once they turn, they get really mad. Yeah. Now, uh, now I'm curious. Uh, it's, it's still a fifty-fifty shot that if we Googled that guy's name, he shows up somewhere in an earlier article in a bar saying he definitely still supports Trump, or a diner. Yeah, right. Whichever one they well, were. Well, the diner burned people. down. So that's although he was in that. California, they didn't they didn't interview people there because that's no, coastal. No, it's, it's coastal. You don't you, you don't want to do that. You only want to do uh, uh, states that don't touch the ocean. Yes, right. I don't know why that is, but okay. 
All right. And then uh, I'm going to leave you with this final point. And this is just interesting because of who said it. The fellow's name is John Weaver. Okay. You hmm. remember John Weaver? Um, not specifically, but I probably will by the end of this. GOP strategist, segment. works uh, very closely with John Kasich. Okay. Fairly famous guy, goes by the handle JWGOP on Twitter. Oh. All right. What's and he up says, to? says, uh, this hack, Brian Kemp, is the next <laughs> governor, that's in scare quotes, of Georgia. But he cheated and undermined democracy every step of the way. Stacey Abrams should be governor, but isn't due to actions that can't be tolerated. She has a bright future. We need a new enforceable Voting Rights Act now. This okay. is a Republican. All right. I'll take it. I will take it, too. And I think that's the future. There's going to be plenty of people who just have had enough of Trump. When the time comes, you'll see. It's too early to see it now because you can't prove it till the vote in 2020. We'll see if he's still even on the ballot at that point. But uh, take heart from what happened over the last few weeks, this election over the last few weeks. And despite the results in Florida, we did quite well. Take care, and uh, I'll talk to you next week. Yes, all right. Well, happy Thanksgiving, and uh, enjoy your your turkey. You're a turkey person. I'm not talking to a vegetarian at the moment, am I? You are not. Okay. All right. Well, those of you who are vegetarian, enjoy your Thanksgiving as well. I'm not saying that you can't do that. but Yeah, we're not doing the sure turkey thing right... either, you know, where it's like no. traditional turkey. But uh, this is great thing. work in speaking with my friend Kegro in the morning, David Waldman. I should yes. remember to tell you that in uh, case you uh, wandered in here and didn't know who the heck we were or who he was. It's his I don't show. Know how you would do that. But uh, we'll look forward to it. I hope you tape stuff for us. But uh, if not, see you next Monday. Yes. All right. Thanks. We'll see you next Monday, whether Ooh. I do or not. So that's good news. Uh, all right. Well, that uh, let's see. That's a good starting point for the day. And I think I even got remembered to make my own points about what Greg said while he was still here. So that's a good day uh, from my perspective. Let's see. Uh, there are 35 million different directions to go in, as usual. And as I'm scanning across some of these, I'm thinking, oh, that would be good for saving for later in the week. But I don't know whether I can resist on some of these things. Um, let's see. I grabbed something else from Daniel Dale this morning. Something, a point he has made before, but which a point was raised by Jay Rosen about what Daniel said, which I had forgotten about. Daniel Dale was pointing out uh, again today, and I guess another one of the foibles, the Trump foibles from over the weekend, of course, he did go to California. And uh, pissed off that guy, uh, what's his name, who uh, said he could kiss his red ass. Uh, so, okay, we should check in on that. We, should, we might as well quote that guy by name if I can remember to flip back and find that story. Anyway, so he went out there and he insulted everybody and yada, yada. And uh, the clip we all saw was of him standing around in his uh, getup, standing around in some uh, a photo set up of you know, some burned out houses. And he's with the governor, Jerry Brown, and the incoming governor, Gavin Newsom. And he's standing there giving his comments for the evening news. And uh, I guess they have gone to visit Paradise, uh, which, for whatever reason, he can't remember the name of. He knows it begins with a P, and it's something he likes. <laughs> so he's like, he keeps referring to it as the town of of pleasure. Now, pleasure, California, is a very different place, I think, than Paradise, California. And I understand, you know, they both have positive connotations, but they also have, you know, mixed meanings as well. But pleasure, that he can keep uh, in mind. Paradise, he can't remember. Okay, so fine. So he screws up, right? Sure. But as Daniel notes, the way he actually handles it, what's interesting to me, he says, is not that Trump sometimes misspeaks, everybody does, right? But how he reacts when he realizes, rather than apologize, you know, in other words, rather than saying, uh, we were just in pleasure, uh, and they all say, they let him do it twice. The second time he screws up and says pleasure, everybody at <laughs> once says, paradise, paradise, oh yeah, paradise. And so instead of saying, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got the name wrong, it's it was paradise. I, sorry about that. Instead of apologizing, he'll say, or the correct word. In other words, once again, they say, he says, we were just uh, what happened in pleasure, paradise, or paradise, which although sometimes, I mean, I guess I do that, or what I mean is paradise is my way of 
thinking and sometimes what only comes out is or but he does this all the time rather than apologize as always say or the correct word as if it's a subjective choice between the correct word and the equally valid word he used is the way daniel puts it and we saw some examples of that i don't know probably last week maybe the week before he keeps saying you know, he showed us a couple examples and they were very clear where he just says the entirely wrong word and then tries to talk his way out of it by saying, and also, you know, the right thing as opposed to the incorrect thing, which I just said. Uh, but uh, what comes up is Jay Rosen saying uh, uh, about this, and Daniel says, oh my gosh, I forgot about this one. It was so amazing. Dan, uh, Jay Rosen says, remember that time he called some ordinary person he was trying to praise by a wrong name and then made up a story about how the guy told him he actually uses both names. Do you remember that? And what's so interesting about that one is, uh, oh, well, first of all, it's it's certainly true. And we'll tell you how it happened. But Jay Rosen makes this comment. Remember that time? And another user, another Twitter user says, wow, is there a video of that one? And a third user says, yes, it was in the goddamn State of the Union address. That's right. I had forgotten about that one myself. And Daniel gives us the backstory here from back at uh, in, in whatever the hell it was, whichever of the State of the Unions. Uh, or, or remember, one of them wasn't the State of the Union address, of course. So if there really was, if it really was in the State of the Union, then it would have been the last January. And uh, Daniel was covering that one and has his tweets from that one. Oh, man, he said at the time, this ICE gentleman, an ICE agent, goes by CJ, as Trump's prepared text said. But Trump accidentally said DJ, which, you know, can happen. But so instead of conceding, just conceding he'd slipped, he said the man told him, call me either one. You know, I can never be wrong. A, a DJ over here. Uh, his name is CJ. Ah, yes, but he told me I could call him either one. CJ, DJ, doesn't matter. So, uh, as he says, that, he follows up the next day with another tweet. Important journalism alert. ICE will not tell me if Celestino Martinez goes by DJ while also going by CJ. I'd recommend using his full name, Celestino Martinez, said spokesperson uh, Jennifer Elzea. Not that important what the name of the spokesperson is, but it's there, so I'll say it. Yeah, uh, in other words, he screwed up. He called the guy a DJ. They said, no, his name is CJ. And he says, he told me I could call him either one. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to call him and ask him. Uh, you know what? Uh, we don't really know. Essentially, it's another amazing example of how, you know, I'm never wrong, which is fantastic and a great way to approach the presidency and uh, can lead to no problems whatsoever. All right. Let's see. Uh, a couple of other interesting items. Uh, let's see. Oh, good. I found my article finally. That is the uh, factual basis for the comments from the president of Finland. So that's good news. Uh, let's see. Over the last couple of days, I guess we've finally nailed down. I think this happened on Friday. We didn't get a chance to mention it, but you will. again, this is a, this is just by way of recapping and acknowledging that this has happened. Uh, the intelligence agency, the CIA in particular, apparently has released its report on the Jamal Khashoggi killing and has reached its own conclusion. Look, MBS ordered the assassination, period. That's all there is to it. And Trump is now busy squirming around trying to uh, pretend, that, no, no, uh, we, you know, either they don't know that for sure or they can't prove it. And if so, apparently he's he's confused by the whole thing and he keeps insisting, well, if that's really true, then where's the body? Which, you know, is really neither here nor there. But apparently that that's his way of dealing with the fact that he's essentially, I don't know, he's trusted Jared Kushner to develop a relationship with this guy and I mean, he did and he was hoping that he could trust Jared not to tell him to cozy up to a guy who was ordering these kinds of murders although I don't know that it necessarily disturbs Donald Trump all that much I mean every once in a while you interview him about things like that he keeps saying what we're such angels we're always uh, ordering people to get killed all the time so other countries do the same thing 
it might not bother him. But, uh, uh, you know, he's been very cozy with the Saudis as well and keeps commenting on the record, oh, I'm supposed to hate them. They buy apartments for me. It's fantastic. And this is the same kind of person who's buying apartments from him all the time. And the fact that he's a murderer, I don't, I don't know that it necessarily disturbs him since he's sold so many apartments to so many murderers, but he hates when it's exposed. And he'll end up blaming Jared Kushner for this one, I think, more than anything else. Um but let's uh which I've got a couple of stories on this one. Um and uh well uh, again this could be something that we spend time with exploring on another day. Well, it's actually a pretty short piece. So maybe we'll just sum this one up and uh let it take us into the break here. In death, I grabbed this one. In death, Khashoggi exposes the corruption of Kushner and Trump. This is a medium dot com piece from Greg O'Lear, himself an author. And uh, here's the deal. A report released yesterday, that would have been last week, by the CIA concluded that Jamal Khashoggi, a prominent Saudi journalist who was living in the United States, was assassinated on direct orders from Mohammed bin Salman, crown prince of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The kingdom dispatched a 15-man death squad to Istanbul, comprised of members of MBS's own security detail, to make the hit. On October 2nd, the assassins concocted a reason to lure Khashoggi into the consulate. There, they spent seven full minutes torturing him, slicing off his fingers and other body parts while he was still alive. And then they killed him and hacked up the remains with a bone saw. We know all of this detail, and I guess just by way of background, we'll use that to lead us up to the break. But uh, I guess... Some of this is is not new to most of us, but I thought the conclusion summed some things up for us and clarified a few things. We'll share those on the other side of the break. Consider this a very gruesome teaser, perhaps. Uh, We'll be back in just one minute to tell you the rest of what's contained herein. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Continuing with the Medium.com piece from Greg O'Lear. He has set things up nicely and that, uh, well, we all knew most of this to be true as the background of the Khashoggi killing. Uh, however, uh, he reminds us this, uh, all of the, the facts or the, the, the facts as we came to know them were all at odds with the Saudi cover story which was that Khashoggi, a portly man of letters, that's not particularly kind, but okay, a few days away from his 60th birthday, initiated a fist fight with his interrogators and died of a sedative overdose given when he was restrained, at which point his body was sawed into pieces for undisclosed reasons. (laughs) Yeah, that didn't really work all the way through, does it? Uh, The Saudi prosecutor is seeking the death penalty for five members of the death squad, which is, I guess, appropriate. The CIA explanation also conflicts with the version provided by the Turkish government. That's a problem. That Khashoggi was strangled to death immediately upon entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and was no longer alive when his body was dismembered. Hmm. However, President Recep... uh, Again, we've never uh, really dealt with his first and second names. Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, and we can just say Erdogan, I suppose, and leave it at that, has been insistent that Khashoggi's death was no accident. Of course, being strangled immediately, uh, you know, is also not really much of an accident either. But okay, Uh, let me see. Do I have this right here? I want to just pour over that previous paragraph for a second. The Saudi cover story never made any sense. We understand that. The Saudi prosecutor seeking the death penalty, yes. CIA explanation also conflicts with the version provided by the Turkish government. So the CIA explanation was that they tortured him for a long time and cut his fingers off and then they killed him and hacked him up. Is that the CIA version or is that the Turkish version? Because in the Turkish version, had the uh, they've got the tapes and I thought the idea was that there was audio that proved that, you know, A, how long the operation took to complete and B, that he was alive for some portion of the time. So I'm not certain from this construction which one is the CIA explanation. The CIA explanation conflicts with the version provided by the Turkish government, colon, that Khashoggi was strangled to death immediately upon entering the consulate in Istanbul and was no longer alive when his body was dismembered. Is that the Turkish government's version of it? I I don't think I'm up 
to date enough on the story to to know if I'm reading that correctly, but that's what it looks like grammatically. Both Turkey and Saudi Arabia are nominally U.S. allies. We need the former for its strategic military bases and the latter for both its oil and its vast investment capital. Despite being a NATO member and ostensibly a democracy, Turkey jails more journalists than almost any other country in the world. The kingdom, meanwhile, is a full-blown dictatorship. No joke. We know this. And despite a valiant attempt to portray MBS as a Western-style reformer, a, the crown prince has tightened, not loosened, his grip on absolute power in Saudi Arabia. There would be no reason, though, for him to be expected to loosen his grip on absolute power in Saudi Arabia. If he, if I, I guess I would say one, I guess one note of caution on all that. There, there definitely was an attempt to portray MBS as a Western-style reformer, but that was poorly founded from the beginning. There was nothing about being a crown prince of a private compound masquerading as a nation that is Western style at all. At best, if you were reading it wisely, you were reading an attempt to portray MBS as a Western friendly reformer. It turns out that he was not a reformer either, but the idea that he was Western friendly was what they were trying to portray. And that, and, and indeed there are still people who would insist to you that killing Khashoggi doesn't make him any less Western friendly. That is to say, uh, these are people who, like Donald Trump, uh, feel perfectly comfortable saying, hey, Western style democracies kill people all the time. And they do, but you don't, what about it? And you don't blow it off the way that these guys do. And at least you're not supposed to. Anyway, uh, yes, so there, there is that. Uh, Putting aside the heinousness of the actual crime, to say nothing of MBS's betrayal of the members of his own security detail, they were disposable from the beginning to him. And and they knew that, too. I mean, they were on the job to take a bullet for him, if necessary. That's disposable. I mean, you know, you can pretty it up all you like, but they're essentially disposable people to him. Okay, Uh, five of whom will likely be executed for their role in the operation. The Khashoggi affair has dramatic significance to the United States in general and to Donald Trump and Jared Kushner in particular. This week, that would really be last week, Trump floated the idea of handing over the Turkish dissident Fethullah Yulan, we talked about him last week, who now lives in Pennsylvania, to Erdogan's government. Yulan's extradition has long been on Erdogan's wish list. Recall that disgraced former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn was offered $15 million dollars by the Turks to achieve this result, which is why he's awaiting sentencing. Yulin, a Muslim cleric, is the leader of a reform movement, not reform, focused on education and religious tolerance. Boo! His beef with Erdogan involves the latter's corruption. Allegedly. To hand a moderate reformer to an autocrat for certain execution flies in the face of everything America stands for, except... Now America stands for uh, sending people back to certain execution and persecution that they are fleeing as immigrants to the United States. And so it's all quite consistent now. But Trump would certainly do just that if enough could be gained for himself personally. With respect to the assassination, both Trump and Kushner both have skin in the game. Saudi Arabia was the first state Trump visited as president. I guess he puts it this way. Saudi Arabia was the first state visit Trump made, get it, as president. A trip organized and pushed for by Jared Kushner, who is chummy with the crown prince and has acted as the de facto ambassador to the kingdom. Khashoggi was not, and remember this is something we found out a bit ago, Khashoggi was not banned from Saudi media for his criticisms of MBS but rather for his criticisms of Donald Trump. More importantly, U.S. intelligence knew of a plan to lure Khashoggi back to the kingdom to arrest him, so the president and the de facto ambassador to Saudi Arabia must also have known. If they knew and did not share the information with Khashoggi, they are liable, per the Washington Post. I don't know whether that's really a statement they can stand by, liable, but they're certainly responsible. Per the Washington Post, O'Lear says... Uh, And here, uh, referring to, we don't see the title of the piece. Okay, 
I'll just read it to you. Intelligence agencies have a duty to warn people who might be kidnapped, seriously injured, or killed, according to a directive signed in 2015. But, you know, that's Obama, so it doesn't count. The obligation applies regardless of whether a the person is a U.S. citizen. Khashoggi was a U.S. resident. Now, why exactly are Trump and Kushner going to the mat for MBS? Is it to advance U.S. interests or their own? The answer, obviously, uh, their own. Last October, Jared Kushner paid an unannounced visit to Riyadh, where he stayed up until the wee hours talking, quote, strategy with the crown prince, his new BFF. He allegedly gave MBS an enemies list, culled from the classified president's daily brief, which the crown prince used the following month to purge disloyal relatives from government and take their money. That's important. Also last October, Kushner's company received a $57 billion loan from a subsidiary of Soft Fund. That would be the guys behind SoftBank. Remember them, I think? I think we have that, right? The Saudi investment concern to bail out its troubled property at one journal square in Jersey City. The larger and more widely reported loan to bail out the troubled property at 666 Fifth Avenue came the following summer via Qatar. There is a term for the exchange of U.S. intelligence, or worse, policy, for money. The term is espionage. It is punishable by death. For the record, I have no financial interests in Saudi Arabia, Trump tweeted, any suggestion that I have is just more fake news, of which there is plenty. This is skirting the truth at best, and at worst, an outright lie, as the Washington Post reported. Trump famously demands loyalty of his subordinates, but is he loyal to his country or himself? The American people need to know. A little rather more melodramatic ending than was absolutely necessary, but it's really true. I mean, the hard part was getting to uh, the line about, yeah, there's a term for exchanging U.S. intelligence or worse policy for money. It's espionage and it's punishable by death. Yeah, and uh, well, we'll probably never get to that point, but all indications are that, uh, yeah, uh, Jared Kushner, through his access to the president's daily brief, uh, sold intelligence to the Saudis in exchange for a loan on a piece of property in Jersey City. Doesn't get any lower than that. And that's not just because I don't like Jersey City very much. But hey, okay. Uh, I just thought we ought to have that one on the record because it uh, states things about as directly as anyone else has for some time. All right, another outrage or two to round up. Walter Schaub, who many of you follow on Twitter because, of course, he is constantly reminding us of each technical violation of government ethics rules that comes to light in the Trump administration. He himself, the former director of the Office of Government Ethics. You may perhaps be following him on Twitter as well. Uh, little noticed in the, uh, what should we say, chattering classes, I guess, so far. But uh, hard to say, little noticed overall, since it was retweeted over 26,000 times. This is an outrage. There's another one. Ready? DOJ, the Department of Justice, refusing to release Matthew Whitaker's financial disclosure form. I don't think I even, I've just not heard a whole lot about that other than from this tweet. So, uh, of course, he reminds us that is illegal, unheard of, and highly suspicious. What is DOJ hiding? That is a good question. And he links to a tweet by American Oversight. They tweet at the uh, address of at we are oversight uh, on Twitter. A new letter. Where are acting attorney general Whitaker's financial disclosures? The public has a right to know. The letter itself is screenshotted here, but there is a link to a post at their blog spot. I guess here uh, American oversight dot org. Letter to OGE regarding Matthew Whitaker's lack of public financial disclosures. Is there more to the post than just the letter? Just, uh, no, not really. Just a little paragraph here that says this is, this is that letter. And I guess we can take a quick look at it here and uh, see exactly what's going on. 
Uh, let's see, to uh, Emery A. Rounds the Third, director, current director of the U.S. Office of Government Ethics, dated November 16th. Dear Mr. Rounds, as the director of American Oversight, what is it? Why, it's a nonprofit organization dedicated to accountability and ethics in government, which sounds great. I am concerned to discover that the Department of Justice is not making available to the public in a timely fashion any public financial disclosure reports filed by Matthew Whitaker, recently appointed acting attorney general by President Trump. As you are no doubt aware from your long career in government ethics, transparency is a critical component to the government ethics program of the federal government. Recognizing that citizens should know their leaders' financial interests, more than 40 years ago, Congress enacted the financial aid, I'm sorry, financial disclosure provisions. I'm, I'm thinking about college applications. The financial disclosure provisions of the Ethics in Government Act The purpose of these provisions is to facilitate transparency regarding potential financial conflicts of interest posed by the personal interests of senior United States government officials. I think you know all of this, but in case you were interested in getting all the uh, the paragraphs and uh, uh, sections, etc., we can read through this accordingly. The act imposes detailed requirements for public financial disclosure by such senior officials. The Office of Government Ethics, or OGE, Form 278. E, is it E or C? I have to zoom in on this thing. Can we, I can't even tell. Look at that. Wow, that's pretty, uh, I guess I got to visit the eye doctor here. And I wanted to get that right too. It looks like an E, a lowercase E. Form 278E and the OGE form 278T. Wow, how about that? An E and a T. They are financial disclosure reports that are intended to ensure disclosure of the information that the act requires covered officials to disclose. Appointees to senior government positions covered by this filing requirement must file their public financial disclosures within 30 days of assuming the duties of the position covered by the filing requirements. The appointees agency may grant an extension of up to 45 days for good cause shown with the possibility of an additional extension of up to 45 days. Boy, that's an awful lot. That's 90 days. Thus, under OGE regulations, a covered appointee has at most 120 days from taking office to file required public financial disclosures. I feel like uh, we're well within that window, though. Matthew Whitaker was reportedly appointed chief of staff to Attorney General Jeff Sessions on October 4th, 2017. Oh, we still haven't seen that, eh? I get it now. As a non-career senior executive service appointee at the Department of Justice, Mr. Whitaker is a required public filer. Consequently, the latest possible deadline for him to file the required public financial disclosure, assuming he received two extensions for good cause shown, was February 1st, 2018. Ah, this isn't uh, a new obligation that comes as a result of his appointment as purported acting attorney general. It was attached to his service as chief of staff. Hmm. As an incumbent of more than 60 days in a covered position, Mr. Whitaker was also refi- required to file an additional annual public financial disclosure report by May 15th, 2018, again with two possible 45-day extensions, so at most no later than August 13th, 2018, also a date long since passed. In light of his recent appointment as acting attorney general, supposedly, American Oversight requested that the Department of Justice provide access to the two public financial disclosure reports that Mr. Whitaker was required to file as a new entrant and incumbent in a covered position. As you know, OGA regulations require the agency to, quote, permit inspection of the reports by or furnish a copy of the report to any person who makes written application as provided by agency procedure, unquote. However, The Department of Justice has not yet permitted inspection or furnished a copy of these public financial disclosure reports, notwithstanding the overwhelming public interest in understanding the potential conflicts of interest of the new acting attorney general. Moreover, the Department of Justice's Departmental Ethics Office has not been willing to provide any specific estimate for when the department will be in a position to furnish a copy of any financial disclosures filed by Mr. Whitaker. In the interest of minimizing the burden to the Departmental Ethics Office. American Oversight also offered to come and inspect the reports in person rather than wait for the furnishing of a copy to be prepared, but the department declined that offer. In addition, it is our understanding that there have been numerous other requests for Mr. Whitaker's public 
Financial Disclosure reports since his appointment as purported acting attorney general and the department has not made the reports available for inspection or furnished a copy to any public requester. This is all the more surprising given that OGE's regulations require agencies to be prepared to make public financial disclosure reports available to the public within 30 days of their filing and it has been many months since Mr. Whitaker was legally required to file his disclosures. Transparency regarding potential conflicts of interest is a core tenet of the federal government ethics program, especially given the tremendous responsibilities he has recently assumed as acting head of the Department of Justice. The absence of any public disclosure regarding Mr. Whitaker's potential conflicts of interest is quite troubling. The department's apparent unwillingness to make his public financial disclosure reports publicly available or even provide an estimate for disclosure now, 10 days after his appointment as acting attorney general, also raises the disturbing possibility that Mr. Whitaker has potentially failed to comply with his legal obligations under OGE regulations to file timely public disclosures. We strongly urge OGE to undertake an investigation regarding the status of Mr. Whitaker's public disclosure reports and take steps to promote appropriate transparency and public awareness regarding his potential conflicts of interest. Sincerely, Austin R. Evers, Executive Director, American Oversight. Shoo! Well, it was dense, but full of information and, uh, well, information rich, we'll say. And it's a good point. I didn't realize uh, that he never filed even as Chief of Staff and that nobody can get a hold of this thing. I mean, this is now an extremely important financial disclosure. And uh, what do you do? This is another one of those little bits of norm shattering. It's never really been contemplated, and it was never contemplated in the design of the statutes, that uh, the relevant statutes here, that anybody would simply say, well, no, I'm not going to do it. And I mean, think about the implications of the acting, whatever, purported acting attorney general saying, I'm not going to comply with financial disclosure laws, and what are you going to do about it? Because how are you going to prosecute me? It's obviously a federal issue. How do you get the Department of Justice to put pressure on the head of the Department of Justice using the criminal justice system? It seems rather difficult. I'm not certain who's going to take up that task. But hey, you know, who cares? Yeah, LOL, YOLO, nothing matters, even though we said that that doesn't matter. It, it no longer works necessarily for voters, but it seems to buy an awful lot of time for people who should otherwise be uh, worried about ending up in jail. But uh, they run the jails, for one thing. And so I guess it doesn't bother them a great deal. Coincidentally. Okay. Well, that seems rather weird. All right. Let me uh, grab a couple other stories that are floating around here, some of which uh, I think are of appropriate length for sharing today. Others nominating themselves for consideration for later in the week. Uh, this one, again, not exactly news, but it's always good to see it organized and put down in print. A Mother Jones piece from Russ. Choma, C-H-O-M-A, from middle of last week, I believe. Uh, oh, okay, November 14th. Trump campaign, you're never going to believe it. Trump campaign paid millions to Trump businesses during midterms. Yeah, we figured as much. But here is the organized report on that and exactly how it happened. Donald Trump's 2020 presidential campaign raised and spent an unprecedented sum of money during the midterm elections. It's usually not that active during midterms, but okay, this one, this president's campaign is. But much of that cash wasn't used to help endangered Republicans in Congress. It was used to help Donald Trump. That's right. Huge surprise. Presidential campaigns don't typically raise much or any money during midterm election cycles leaving congressional candidates and national parties to do most of the financial work. Uh, of course, usually you don't do five rallies a day during the midterms either. But so, you know, there was good reason for him to be raising that money 
to pay for that program of making him happy by allowing him to speak to adoring audiences. Okay. During the 2010 cycle, I guess by way of comparison, Barack Obama's campaign raised nothing. His 2010 campaign finance filings are filled with notations of returned donations, not newly collected ones. Obama went on to raise $738 million for his 2012 re-election, but that effort didn't start until the late spring of 2011. Trump, on the other hand, kicked off his 2020 fundraising efforts within hours of his inauguration last year, and his presidential campaign alone raised $60 million through the end of September, the latest month for which filings are available. Working with the Republican National Committee, Trump appears to have raised at least another $46 million. GOP congressional candidates complained that they were swamped by Democratic fundraising this year, much of it small-dollar donations from a highly energized base. With that war chest, with the war chest Trump's campaign amassed, he could have been well-positioned to be a powerful ally to struggling Republicans. He mostly was not. Instead, through the end of September, his campaign paid $3.2 million to Trump's own properties and businesses. There was money paid for rent at Trump Tower. There were <clears throat> hotel rooms at the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C. There were banker room rentals at the Trump Country Clubs in New Jersey and Florida. The Trump campaign also paid for more than $1.2 million worth of flights using Trump's personal jets. Remember, my favorite scam. Planes the president no longer travels on, but which other family members still do. And of course, so do the Secret Service details that go with them. And they, too, have to buy tickets on his personal or his charter jets. <clears throat> Much of the remaining money was spent on services for Trump's own reelection and fundraising effort. Trump's digital operation, online ads, videos and social media messaging cost one point eight million dollars during that time period. More than half of that, $5 million, went to a firm owned by the head of Trump's 2020 campaign, Brad Parscale. No wonder he agrees with uh, the strategy. It was also a good election for Trump's attorneys. His campaign spent $5.9 million on legal consulting. Trump, however, wasn't just a record-setting fundraiser and spender this cycle. He was also a record-setting hoarder. At the end of September, the bulk of the money he brought in, $35.4 million, was sitting in the bank. Trump did make a few big expenditures on behalf of congressional Republicans. Notably, his campaign made a $6 million national ad buy in late October that was intended to serve as a final message, arguing that voters should preserve the GOP majorities. It was an un-Trumpian final message. There literally was no mention of Trump in it and the commander-in-chief reportedly did not like it. And it was probably undercut by another ad released by the campaign, an anti-immigrant screed that was banned from major television networks that deemed it too racist for the airwaves. Hmm. Yeah, not, uh, not a great development strategically for the Trump campaign, but that's actually the end of the piece here. And uh, just good to note along the way, just exactly how much money is being paid to his own businesses and uh, just how little of it is going to help other Republican candidates. That's not typically the way you build loyalty, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see whether, whether the loyalty remains. I did see noted today, and I didn't grab this one for Twitter, but probably I should have, and I wonder if I can uh, scroll around and find it. Let's see, where did it come from? I would have to search it up on the uh, the Twitter web page here. And uh, let's see, where can I go and do that? Oh, look at that. We got the next break coming up in just a second, but maybe we can switch. It was about uh, Mario... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm Marco Rubio. Mar uh, do, uh, I'm doing both names at once. Rubio. Um, and uh, the tweet was that uh, was suggesting that Rubio's political positioning was evolving. And I think that was probably the wrong 
word for it. Uh, here we are. The Orlando Sentinel had this story, and I guess it's their tweet, too, but it's nearly time for us to go. But we can read the tweet. He's evolving, and I think it's devolving. Once a sunny conservative, Marco Rubio goes all in on Trumpism. And remember that we did hear this morning, Greg told us that Jennifer Rubin was saying, there's only two problems in the Republican Party, Trump and Trumpism. And uh, I guess there's only one that Marco Rubio can fully embrace. He can't actually become Trump, but he can become something of a Trumpist. Why you would call that evolution, I have no idea. We'll be back after this. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegger on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. I'm still debating a direction here in which we might want to go. Let's see. Hmm. A couple of different things we could be dealing with here. Uh, but uh, let's see. We just uh, finished up the... A uh, piece about uh, the Trump campaign and funneling money to Trump businesses. And I made mention of the uh, Marco Rubio thing. And perhaps, I guess, we ought to follow up on that one, just since uh, Trump and Trumpism came up earlier in the show. Although uh, there's also an article that Greg holds out as a follow-up to our discussions in California trying to not only plan today's show, but plan ahead for the rest of the week uh, is making me second guess everything. Let's take a look at this Marco Rubio piece because reasons, and we know uh, we're always wound up about Marco Rubio thanks to uh, Armando's constant focus on him and with good reason. He's evolving, again, the wrong word, once a sunny conservative, and that was probably false too, Marco Rubio goes all in on Trumpism. Let's find out what that is all about here, in case you aren't able to guess for yourself. Just four years ago, Marco Rubio was gearing up to run for president with an inclusive and sunny message designed to capture the imagination of a modernizing Republican Party, and maybe even the country. Those days and that candidate are long gone. Like many Republicans, the second-term Florida senator has sounded more and more like President Donald Trump since the 2016 election, striking a notably darker and foreboding tone while adopting some of Trump's slash-and-burn political tactics and controversial positions. Since the November 6th midterm elections, Rubio has stood at the, on the front lines of the partisan war here in Florida over his state's recount, storming social media with criticisms of Democrats and seizing on incomplete information to raise doubts about the intentions of election officials. He also penned a Wall Street Journal op-ed declaring that, quote, Trump is right about nationalism, unquote, embracing a term fraught with racial and historical baggage, though he argued it is not about ethnicity, though it is. I do think he's evolving, said Brian Ballard, a Rubio associate and Republican donor in Florida. I have noticed his tweets are much more in your face. His latest transformation has revived criticism among some Republicans that Rubio is a politician without a core a shapeshifter who has bounced from Tea Party insurgent to sunny moderate to Trump acolyte with little compunction. Rubio is a survivor who constantly reassesses the political environment, said Dan Eberhardt, a donor to Florida Republican Governor Rick Scott, who sealed his victory in the Senate race Sunday when Democratic Senator Bill Nelson conceded defeat at the conclusion of a manual recount. Rubio has been at the center of other movements when the GOP reset itself. He won his Senate seat in 2010 after defeating an establishment Republican in the Tea Party wave. Does that get to be a wave? Really. Then in 2013, he shifted to a moderate posture by helping lead a failed push to pass a comprehensive immigration bill. 
He has since distanced himself from that compromise while adopting a harsher posture on border issues. Nearing the halfway point of Trump's first term, other prominent Republicans have undergone a similar metamorphosis. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who once called Trump a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot on CNN, has been, as has, has, I guess has since, we'll say, become one of the president's most ardent defenders on Capitol Hill. And departing United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley, who warned of deadly consequences in 2016 if Trump did not change his rhetoric, said Trump should not be blamed in the aftermath of the mass killing at a Pittsburgh synagogue. Rubio is an ambitious politician in the nation's largest swing state, where Trump and his allies have now had success in two straight elections. Republican former Congressman Ron DeSantis, whose political ascent has stemmed largely from his enthusiastic support of the president, won the governor's race after a machine recount of ballots. In the Senate race, Trump encouraged Scott to run. Rubio's office declined to make him available for an interview, but people close to him offered several possible explanations for his current approach. He will not be on the ballot until 2022 and feels liberated to speak his mind. He feels that he needs to channel the message of his 2010 campaign more aggressively. And he is looking to stay relevant in a party in which Trump has won widespread support. His relationship with Trump has improved since they were bitter rivals in the 2016 presidential primary and they found common cause in the Florida recount. Trump took to Twitter to accuse Democrats of trying to, quote, steal the election and made baseless allegations of voter fraud. Rubio jumped on board with similar arguments. Meanwhile, today's articles are about how awful it is for Democrats to refer to the election in Georgia as having been stolen. But never mind the fact that Republicans get to do that with impunity. Just thought I'd note that for the record. Returning to the article, though, I don't know what's in this sealed box found this morning by Broward Sheriff. Hashtag Broward Sheriff. I don't think that's really a hashtag, Mario. Mario. Do I call him Mario? Yeah, I do. Marco, I guess it's because his last name is Rubio. Anyway, but this dysfunction in Broward elections is not acceptable. He tweeted four days after the election with a photo of a crate labeled provisional ballot box. You know what's in there? Provisional ballots. The box contains supplies, the county supervisor of elections said. Maybe this box found this morning has office supplies in it, but if it contains just a single vote, it should have been handled in accordance with the law, no matter who it was a vote for. Rubio tweeted later, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, If it was from uh, Democrats, you're not that worried about it, I'm sure. David Jolly, a former Republican congressman from Florida, expressed concerns about the tactics Rubio, Trump, and Scott have used to stoke suspicion about the electoral proceedings. I think it reflects that the party has moved to listen to darker angels. They're not angels, not better angels, said Jolly, who recently became an independent. Three days after his tweets about the box in Broward County, Rubio used a football analogy, because he's such a great football analyst, to describe lawsuits Democrats had filed. This one got a lot of ridicule. Remember this one? Imagine if if NFL team was trailing 24-22, but in final seconds hit a three-point kick to win. The famous three-point kick. Everyone knows what those are called. Kicks, right? Then after game lawyers for losing team get a judge to order rules change so that last second field goals are only one point he tweeted well that's how democrat lawyers plan to steal the florida election miami-dade county mayor carlos Gimenez, uh, we say Jimenez even though it's a g Gimenez. Hmm. Say a Republican, by the way, uh, said he obviously has learned that it's been effective for the president to tweet. I guess imitation is the best form of flattery. Alex Conant, a former top Rubio aide, said Rubio ran his own Twitter account before he ran for president and always intended to take it back. He's always believed that social media only works if it's authentic and that people can tell when a staffer takes over a politician's Twitter handle. Conant said, I think what you're seeing on Twitter is the real Rubio. Rubio ran a highly scripted, tightly choreographed campaign for president, a strategy that was used against him to devastating effect. In a televised debate, GOP rival Chris Christie lambasted him for repeating an oddly phrased talking point four times during a debate. Let's dispel with this fiction. 
Remember that one? That Barack Obama doesn't know what he's talking about. A moment that branded him as robotic in front of a national audience. The Florida senator also found little success with his aspiring campaign theme, efforts to cast himself, a child of Cuban immigrants with blue-collar jobs, as the embodiment of the American dream and a youthful voice for a new generation, were drowned out by Trump's darker pitch. After trying to sidestep Trump, Rubio finally engaged him late in the campaign, calling him a con man and lobbing personal attacks he later said he regretted and were embarrassing to his daughters. As it became clear his campaign was on its last legs, Rubio said it was, quote, getting harder every day, unquote, to commit to supporting the GOP nominee. Trump, meanwhile, repeatedly and devastatingly referred to him as Little Marco. The relationship shifted after Trump became president. They worked together on a new Cuba policy. Rubio found common ground with Ivanka Trump, the president's daughter and senior advisor on family leave. Donald Trump Jr. frequently retweeted the senator during the recount. Another shift in Rubio's suddenly warmer relationship with Scott following past tensions between their camps, which flared up this year. After the election, Rubio jumped at the chance to get involved on Scott's behalf, joining a call with reporters hosted by the Scott campaign, asked whether Scott should use his powers as governor to remove Broward County Supervisor of Elections Brenda Snipes, a controversial Democrat, really. Rubio replied, yeah, I guess many people would say so. Rubio replied, I certainly think that once this is all done, she's certainly a candidate for removal. Wow, that was pretty bold. Duh. He added, whether that will happen while Governor Scott's in office or not, obviously that's not my determination to make because he's so bold. A Scott lawyer quickly followed up by adding that the governor was not considering removing her. He's done a 180, said Everhart, the Scott donor. There was a lot more distance between them a year ago. Rubio has broken with Trump on some occasions, but there have been limits to his willingness to stray. At the start of the of Trump's presidency, Rubio expressed reservations about his pick for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. Ultimately, however, he voted for Tillerson. And earlier this year, Rubio emerged as one of the most vocal Republican critics of Trump's policies on China. But even his opposition to the president on that issue served as an acknowledgement of how Trump had defined the terms of political combat. In May, Rubio used a twist on a Trumpian turn of phrase to attract attention to his critique. This is hashtag not winning, he tweeted. Wow, that fell flat. And what a dumb ending, <laughs> quite honestly, to the piece. But uh, it was mostly dumb because it was Marco Rubio being Marco Rubio. Okay, so there you have it. Is he evolving? Is that the terminology you would use? Not for me, but uh, I'm sure many of you have your own opinions on that one. And uh, again, more news about things that we thought were fairly obvious. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that there were some organized thoughts on them in order to help bolster our more inchoate opinions about where Marco Rubio was and what he was doing. All right, let's see. Were there a couple of, uh, there's a bunch of comments I haven't gotten to that have come in in the last hour or two. And uh, all the way back in the beginning of the show when we were talking about Finland and and raking, the mighty OCD let us know that he had, uh, let's see, he'd seen this tweet from, who is this? Do I know this guy? No, I don't. Gin and Tacos. Why not? That sounds like a fun kind of name to, that's I guess the name of, the blog spot, uh, the blog that he maintains as well, ginandtacos.com. That's Ed. Uh, well, we don't know what his real name is because he's changed it to a Thanksgiving name following in the tradition, the internet tradition, the Twitter tradition, really, of changing your username for Halloween. Now he is Ed Cranbermilla. <laughs> so who is Ed? Ed, Ed Bermilla is his actual name, I guess, if I'm reading his email correctly. Uh, a political science professor and a writer at The Nation and The Baffler and Deadspin and Jacobin Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he uh, is, so I guess it could be a joke. We don't really know, but it might not be. But uh, Mighty OCD found it entertaining and so do I. Ed says, all you need to know about Finland is that their word for mullet, the haircut mullet, is 
uh, let's see, how shall we say this? Sekik, uh, Sekitkuka, Sekituka. It's a, probably a horrible mangling of it, but it's T S E K K I T U K K A. You say it. You're so smart. Sekituka, which literally means hockey hair, <laughs> which could really be true. So we don't know for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and by the way, as far as the rest of the week goes in terms of, uh, uh, listenership. Rebecca Romans wants us all to know that despite the holiday, I will, as usual, be listening live Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I appreciate you making the effort to provide new content to your loyal listeners while you are away. And that's uh, that's inspiring all by itself. So thank you very much, Rebecca, and I'm sure others thank you too. I was uh, Here's a, another question. Uh, why not poll the audience on this one and take your time in answering uh, or answer right away if you wish. But uh, if I wasn't able to get new content recorded for all three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Is there one or two or what, what's the priority of days that you would want? At first I thought, well, on Thanksgiving, everybody will be busy. Is it, If I got two days recorded, shouldn't I play them on Wednesday and Friday? And then on Thanksgiving, that would be the day least likely to be listening. And then I thought, well, you know how it really goes in your house. If you're not traveling... You're kind of waiting around all Thanksgiving morning, but maybe not beginning at nine o'clock. But I could see where you'd be saying, oh, you know, this would be a great day to sit down and listen at a more leisurely pace because we're not going anywhere. So maybe Thursday would be the day you definitely would want new content. I can't really tell. Uh, it's a, it's a crapshoot and I'm sure I'll get both answers, but I'm just curious. If you guys have something to say about that, let me know. And uh, if we're really lucky, I'll get it all recorded for all of uh, all three days. But now uh, I meant to do it over the weekend, but uh, things caught up with me, of course, and prevented me from getting. And it's also difficult to find quiet space to work during the weekend. It's easy when the kids are in school. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll give it a shot. We'll see. Can we really record three additional shows in two days while still broadcasting from nine to eleven each day? I don't know. That's a tough one. Mighty OCD has an answer for me already. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, everyone will be shopping or sleeping. Ah, I hadn't thought of that possibility. Hmm. All right. So really, basically, no matter what we do, I guess it'll be okay since it's in podcast form. And you can always grab what we've got and uh, format it to your liking. The only real difference will be whether or not uh, do I bother recording these things saying what day they're going to be aired. I really don't, I really don't know. That's a tough one. Okay, well, uh, no more pondering of this. Let's see. We also have this uh, input here from our good friend, our Canadian pundit, our Canuck pundit, if you want to try and find the handle, the correct handle on Twitter. Brian, what's up? MSNBC report here, and he starts off, he prefaces this by saying, can you believe, can we say this? I don't know what we can say on the air. We can say anything we want, but I have to designate this thing finally in iTunes as clean or not. So what's the, what's the answer here? If I uh, say uh, the D word is being, can you believe this D word guy? Uh, all right. Well, let's see. I think you can actually get away with it nowadays, on even on TV, but I don't know. Who cares? The point is you understand what's going on. MSNBC. Wow, Mr. President, that's a good one. Ah, yes. Are we talking about, uh, yeah, we're talking about his tweet about Adam Schiff, S-C-H-I-F-F, who Trump refers to in his tweet as Adam well, something that we would ordinarily get in trouble, I guess, saying on the air if there really was any, you know, uh, regulatory body that was patrolling podcasts. But there isn't. And, I mean, after all, it's S-C-H-I... He refers to him as S-C-H-I-T-T, which is not the actual word. So maybe if I say it, even though it's uh, indistinguishable in spoken language. Oh, you get the idea. Wow, that, Mr. President, that's a good one. Was that like your answers to Mr. Mueller's questions, or did you write this one yourself? Schiff fired back. Yeah, I can believe that guy. And of course, that, by the way, comes in the, if you want to make, make real news reporting out of it, uh, you would note, I guess, the reporters who are saying, why he just said that there has to be decorum in the White House, and then he tweeted that outrageous hypocrisy, et cetera, et cetera. And it really is, but what are you going to do about it? 
nothing you can do. Uh, he said it, and uh, you pointing out the the hypocrisy of it does nothing for us. But okay, I mean, I don't I don't blame you for pointing it out. It should be pointed out. What else have we got here? Um, hmm. Ah, Michael Musson commenting on the Khashoggi situation. CIA says MBS had Khashoggi murdered and dismembered. Trump says I don't believe it. Where's the body? CIA. Nothing. Got nothing to say about that. Either they don't know, but I mean, he was dismembered. He was cut up into pieces. It's all over the place. Where's the body? But okay. Never mind. Uh, let's see. Hmm. 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 We'll have to let that one uh, go for just a bit. I'm just checking over some other things flying by here. Uh, yeah. So uh, I mentioned that, uh, of course, regarding the tweet about the hilarious tweet about Adam Schiff's name the um the idea that there has to be decorum in the white house you remember what that is about and where that comes from that was now did i open i know i opened this somewhere uh is this one it no where did i park this one from the hill uh there was a report uh or, or, or this was following the uh the jim acosta expulsion and then the subsequent court case brought by CNN <clears throat> to regain his press credentials I knew I had this thing open here somewhere and now I can't find it but I'll have to go searching for it in again we'll search uh, here in Twitter and see if we can come up with the piece here but the hill had reported this story hmm. so Acosta loses his or has his credentials revoked. Of course, you all remember that story. And goes to uh, court about it. The CNN sues, and there was a temporary, uh, I guess, restraining order issued by the federal courts that blocked the White House from withholding his credentials. And, you know, everybody sort of knew that it was going to go that way and that what they were doing was highly problematic, if not just outright illegal, unconstitutional, what have you. Uh, and, of course, this was another example of Trump just say, you know, following his own why don't you just ism uh, instincts and finding out later, no, just uh, as always, you're not really particularly good at getting things done. This is why you're a dotard. And this, you lose on everything. You, you have no regard for the law, and the, the courts can't stop rebuking you. But uh, I guess we're set up for another one of these things, because the Hill is reporting the White House is threatening to again pull the Acosta press credentials, according to a CNN report. Uh, we'll just quickly read through the report and then maybe discuss for a second if there's any question about what exactly is going on here. We can address that. The White House is threatening to again pull CNN correspondent Jim Acosta's press credentials after a court-ordered temporary restoration expires at the end of the month, the network reported late Sunday. Friday's court ruling means that a temporary restraining order is in effect for 14 days. But White House officials sent Acosta a letter stating that his press pass is set to be suspended again once the restraining order expires, reported CNN senior media correspondent Brian Stetler, Stelter. Sorry, is it? Yeah, have I been, I've been, in my head I pronounce it wrong all the time. Uh, and his tweets are embedded here, and they, they say pretty much what they said. They said, CNN argued in a statement provided to Stelter that the action would threaten all journalists and news organizations, but it would threaten much more than that. That's why I brought this thing up. The White House is continuing to violate the First and Fifth Amendments of the Constitution, the network stated. I guess that would be the takings part of the Fifth Amendment. These actions, and that's a weird mismatch, by the way. I'd like to talk to the drafters about that one. I don't understand why you married those two things together in the Fifth Amendment. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, these actions threaten all journalists and news organizations. Jim Acosta and CNN will continue to report the news about the White House and the president. Gee whiz, thanks a lot. That was super helpful. The Hill has reached out to the White House, which pulled Acosta's press credentials after a contentious exchange with President Trump during a news conference in which he refused to yield the microphone for comment. 
CNN on Monday requested an emergency hearing in U.S. District Court to address the White House's plan to again pull the credentials. U.S. District Judge Timothy Kelly last Friday granted CNN's request to restore Acosta's hard press pass through a 14-day temporary injunction that expires November 30th. The ruling was limited, however, with Kelly stating that only Acosta's Fifth Amendment rights to due process were violated. The judge, who was appointed by Trump, did not issue a ruling on whether the correspondent's First Amendment rights, First Amendment rights, there you have it, uh, were violated. And that's an important distinction. And it's, uh, there's, I guess there's some question about whether or not you need physical access, or I guess even more specifically, whether you need a hard pass to the White House, which would then entitle you to specific access in order to do the job of, uh, well, not in order to do the job of reporting on the president, but rather uh, in order for CNN to be able to report as a part of a free press. That is a somewhat different question. Uh, and so very wisely, they brought uh, uh, the proceedings under the Fifth Amendment protect, due process protections. And I guess that's supposed to be with the marriage of uh, the right uh, to avoid self-incrimination, you know, to, uh, to refuse to provide testimony that would incriminate you uh, alongside due process. But it's, I mean... It's more often referred, well, I don't know, maybe only in law school, more often referred to as the Fifth Amendment takings clause, i.e. that you can't uh, have property uh, confiscated from you without due process of law. And uh, I guess that's, uh, so that's a good question, whether that's considered property or not. But okay, anyway, the point is, uh, what's really happening here is that, again, norm shattering, most White Houses would say, okay, I understand the limitations of a 14-day restraining order, but it's clear that that has been uh, put in place because, generally speaking, the courts found it fairly obvious on its face that we were violative of the Constitution's uh, protections here, and so we won't go back in that direction. But they just simply say, well, you know, it is what it is, a 14-day temporary injunction. I'll just revoke the pass after there. And if the court comes back and puts another one in place, well, you know what we'll do. We'll give the press pass back, but we'll say, well, next time we're going to do it again. And it's just interesting. So, you know, these are, this is kind of a continuation of the George W. Bush approach to the courts that where they would say, all right, so we lost this one particular case. Uh, normally, White Houses understand that all... Uh, future cases similarly situated should be considered covered by the ruling, but they just literally, they took the ruling literally. This this ruling applies to this case by this name and other similar cases, you know, we may lose, but we're going to continue with our policy until the court steps in and stops every single instance of this particular abuse by name and will overwhelm the courts in so doing and uh, prove our point. So these guys intend to do it in a slightly different way. All right, so where were we? Um, the uh, There was the fact that the ruling was issued on Fifth Amendment grounds, not First Amendment grounds. The judge saying that he wanted to emphasize the very limited nature of this ruling. But he didn't. what he didn't mean was that you can, after 14 days, ignore the uh, admonitions on the Fifth Amendment points as well. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders issued a statement saying officials would temporarily reinstate Acosta's hard pass following the ruling, setting the stage for another possible revocation. Today, the court made clear that there is no absolute First Amendment right to access to the White House. No, it didn't. It just simply failed to address those issues because the Fifth Amendment covers it. But okay. In response to the court, we will temporarily reinstate the reporter's hard pass. Uh, we will also further develop rules and processes to ensure fair and orderly press conferences in the future, sure, of course you will. Trump told Fox News' Chris Wallace in an interview that aired Sunday morning, we didn't even discuss that one, that the ruling isn't a big deal. He also warned that if Acosta misbehaves again, we'll throw him out or end the press conference altogether. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's not a big deal, Trump told Wallace. What they said, though, is that we have to create rules and regulations for conduct, etc., etc. We're doing it. We're going to write them up right now. I'm going to write them myself at my desk in Mar-a-Lago. Uh -huh. 
It's not a big deal if he misbehaves. We'll throw him out or we'll stop the news conference. And that's another interesting thing, too. Apparently, they're addressing inside the White House the idea that, well, hey, if the press misbehaves, by which they mean asking tough questions, I guess, uh, we'll just end the briefings. We'll walk out. They're worthless to us. And (laughs) once again, dithering over the question of whether or not these briefings are worth anything from the press side... Trump has jumped in and beat him in the punch. He's going to boycott the press conferences from his side and leave the press with nothing to do, even though there really isn't very much to do except take dictation these days, I guess, and get into fights to get yourself expelled. That's at least more exciting than taking the dictation. But uh, interesting that he would end up beating him to the punch by declaring his own press conferences invalid ahead of the ahead of time. All right. Time for us to give up the microphones once again. Justice Putnam coming at you next with the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy right here on Netroots Radio next. From Daily Coast Radio on NetrootsRadio.com. You have been listening to the K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Hey, get this one. Trump licks fiddle Lindsey Graham told both sides toady Chuck Todd that acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker is someone who impressed him because of his attitude, his professionalism, and his very solid resume. It is, of course, exactly the opposite. That's a subject we need to return to at some point during the rest of this week. Thankfully, Justice takes it up next.